Welcome. I'm Christy Lamar, a Managing Director at Monitor Deloitte, our strategy practice and the U.S. leader of women in tech. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Imperative, a conversation around how technology enables organiz organizational values. I am honestly thrilled and honored to be spending time with some friends today having this conversation who not only share my passion around DEI, but are absolutely committed to creating change within their organizations, their communities, and really beyond. And this isn't a conversation about why. I think we, while we continue to have that conversation, this is really about how, and really more so technology's role in that. So today I am joined by Nikki Allen. She is the Senior Vice President at Kohl's, as well as Jim Fowler, who's the Chief Information Officer at Nationwide Insurance, and Janet Fowdy, who is our Executive Chair of the Board at Deloitte. Really just an honor to be with you today. Um, before we get into it, you know, our, our audience would really like be interested to learn more about you, Nikki and Jim. Um, so could you spend a little bit of time talking to us about your journey and how you got your to your roles in technology and your passion around DEI? I'll go first. So first off, thank you, Christy, for that warm introduction and so excited to be here for our panel today. Um, a little bit about myself. So as Christy mentioned, I am the SVP of technology at Kohl's, but interesting enough, I am new to Kohl's. So I actually have been in this role for about five months um, and I spent a 20 year, nearly 20 year career at Boeing. So I'd like to say I went from planes to pants, um, but in general, it's always been in the foundation of technology. And for as long as I can remember, I've had this insatiable appetite for learning um, and, and technology. And so for me, I've had tons of roles at Boeing, um, whether it was external customer facing, supporting a, a p and or a portfolio of work, as well as internal roles, uh, supporting the enterprise and enabling our business model through the use of technology. So have about a 20 plus year career in this space. Really, really love it. Um, and excited now to be leading technology in the retail se sector. Awesome. Hey, Chris. And Christy, thanks as well for having me. Uh, so just a little bit about my background. I run technology for Nationwide. I'm stationed in Columbus, Ohio. I've been here for about three years, so I'm uh, newer, like Nikki. Uh, and before that, I spent 18 years at General Electric, where I got a chance to work in every one of their divisional units uh, throughout my career. Uh, you know, in, in that history, so I've been doing this about 25 years, um, I got introduced to an organization called Year Up. Uh, and Year Up focuses on opportunity use so young adults 18 to, to 26 that you know for a lot of reasons uh, have a, a path to a minimum wage job and Europe gives them a set of skills uh, usually in financial services or technology to kind of lift them up to a career uh, and uh, I, I just have been my eyes have been opened uh, through that experience with Europe to all of the opportunity that still exists for us to uh, create more equity in the technology ranks uh, when it comes to diversity. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. So, Janet, going to you, you know, DEI is an important boardroom agenda today, you know, more so than ever. Can you sh share how the board is having that conversation, the intersection around talent, technology, culture, and how it has changed and continues to evolve? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Christy, and what a pleasure to be here um, um, having a uh, virtual conversation with all of you um, and being able to host um, Nikki and Jim, who I have just such great admiration for their leadership on uh, the, the intersection of these topics, as well as both of these topics individually. Maybe just 10 seconds of uh, background about me, um, Christy, as a lead into this discussion is I am in a relatively unique position um, as a female chair of a board. I do have deep technology experience. I led Deloitte's technology business for a number of years, um, but I've also spent a lot of time on, on talent-centric topics. I also had the, the privilege to be the CEO and chair of Deloitte Consulting for a number of years. And the two big agenda topics um, in my time in leading Deloitte Consulting were all about um, talent and the workforce of the future and how we help both digitize our clients' businesses as well as our own. So I come to my role as the executive chair with very deep perspectives on technology and talent and DEI 
Um, and so those have both been very professionally centric topics for me. Um, DEI is absolutely sort of in, in my heart and soul of how I've always had the privilege to lead, though I think we'll have the opportunity to talk today about how much uh, certainly my own thinking has evolved on this topic. Um, so now to get to your question, which is about the boardroom. So the board has the responsibility for the long-term health of the business. That is really ultimately the goal of a board and the investments and protections to that end. So technology and talent both have been top agenda items in the boardroom for some time. But what's been interesting over the last short while is that the pandemic has absolutely exposed um, in our boardroom, and we've certainly seen broadly in the marketplace, is those that prioritize technology and talent investments clearly put their organizations on a stronger path to navigate the crisis and thrive on the other side. So that's one dimension of what we've seen over the last year. The other is the conversation evolving due to the really unexpected and incredibly difficult nature of the social and racial justice movement really beginning um, just about a year ago is the heightened focus on DEI. And I sort of emphasize and underscore the E for equity in DEI in particular. Related, the issue of culture has risen to be a boardroom agenda item in a much more consistent way. And I frankly hadn't thought about that so overtly until I held a session at CES earlier this year. Um, and I was hosting a conversation between um, CIOs and board members. And the idea was to talk about digital disruption and technology. And no matter how I tried to steer, I was the facilitator, I was in the Christie role for that conversation. No matter how I tried to steer the conversation, we ended up talking about culture at the centerpiece. So I want to just give a couple of examples because I think to bring this to life, because Christy, you talked about um, not the why, but the what and the how, is how the conversation is evolving in the, in the boardroom. And I'm certainly hearing this from chairs and directors I engage with, is looking at strategic topics through a really different set of lenses. So is the board challenging management to consider impacts of DEI when making strategic decisions? m and is a pretty um, simple example, but when we really challenged ourselves to think about every boardroom conversation we had, we had lots of discussions about talent and DEI, but m and really important to our business. Were we looking at, were, were our, were, was our M&A activity accretive or dilutive to our diversity agenda as an organization. Um, as new services are being developed and marketed and sold, do we have an equity lens? Is there a potential bias in our products and services? So really trying to bring the broad and um, uh, topic that was easy to just say it's about talent, it's about workforce, and really challenging all of our conversations in the boardroom through a DEI lens. And then maybe the last thing I'll say, because there was a lot packed into that question, is I do believe, and the reason I'm so excited about this conversation today, is the role of technology is going to be key to underpin, underpinning how organizations thrive, and I actually think how we think about DEI. We know certainly that customer digital engagement um, is front and center, and I, my two colleagues here on the phone today uh, are a direct testament of that. You know, we surveyed with Fortune CEOs who said 60%, and I frankly think this number is low, see lasting changes in the way their customers are behaving and how customers interact digitally and how we think about our customers um, through the broad set of lens we're looking at. Certainly virtual hybrid work and technology enabling, enabling our physical and virtual environment as it is today. How do we maintain culture in an increasingly digital environment? And then maybe most important and near and dear to my heart is establishing more equitable systems from how we source, retain, and advance talent to what we do in the market to how we exert influence on broader societal change. I think technology is critical to how we expose what's not working and can help us get on the right path. So it was a deep, deep uh, and broad ranging question, uh, Christy, and I thought I'd just start with those sort of few lenses of things that I'm seeing and that we're thinking about in our boardroom. Yeah, no, I love it. Thanks, Janet. And I like the notion of systems, right? Because I think as a technologist, I tend to think technology systems, but it is very holistic in terms of how we touch and interact and engage and support. Um, so, Jim, going to you, you know, we just 
Janet gave a perspective of really her role in the board and how they're driving change. How does your role as the CIO at Nationwide, like how do you talk to your C-suite partners and peers and, and what is your role in advancing DEI within Nationwide? You know, when, um, you know, I had to make a hard decision. I think Nikki and I are kind of in a similar boat where we had kind of long lived careers with other companies. And whenever you make that decision to leave something that you've been with for so long, it's gotta be for good reason. Uh, and when I looked around and, and this role uh, opportunity became available to me, I started asking a lot of questions about Nationwide. Uh, and one of the things that I found uh, that was a factor in why I chose to come here is that Nationwide really just doesn't talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It, it does live it out in its commitment and how it does business every day. It's one of the reasons we're a Fortune 100 company. It's one of the reasons we're rated as one of the, the top 25 companies to work for in the best places to work survey. Uh, and it's because it all starts at the top. Uh, and, it, and I mean at the top with our board of directors. It was you know Janet just talking about, is this a board topic or not? And I can tell you very much inside Nationwide it is. Um, it, if you look, our, our board of directors is recognized as having one of the most diverse boards in the insurance and financial services industry. Uh, literally when I interviewed with the board, I probably had mo one of the most cogent conversations I've ever had with the board of directors with two of our directors about not just technology, but how it has to evolve and how I need to attract the right talent to be able to make sure that we're building the technology that represents our customers and our members. And so I tell you that that's kind of one of the places is you got to have that board support. And I love to hearing Janet talk about that. Uh, but also talks with your senior leaders. And so one of the things that we've done in the past year is kind of focus inside as well. And so each of our senior leaders has been hosting a series of catalyst for change exchanges where we sit down with all of our associates and we have kind of fact-based solution focused dialogue with our associates and, and leaders. And, and we really use those suggestions uh, for how we're gonna run the organization. Um, in my organization specifically, it created a, the, the, the creation of a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee whose full-time role it is to attract, develop, and retain talent. And, and, and where I'm going with my long-winded answer to you, Christy, is I believe this starts within uh, my organization by having a workforce that's representative of the customers and the members that we do business with. Because if I'm not developing technology that's representative of their needs and, and how they want to interact with us, then I've failed the organization as a whole in its initiative, kind of back to that first topic. And we live it out in our commitment every day, and I can't live out our commitment to the diversity and inclusion of our customers if I don't have a staff internally that looks like they do. Yeah, and that's, you know, I think that is, um, you know, one of the drivers I can tell you in terms of how I started having conversations around it, like how do we create teams that ultimately bring diverse perspectives, have diverse experiences so that we can create tools that drive outcomes so that everyone is included and there are e equitable experiences, right? Um, Nikki, tell us a little bit about what's happening at Kohl's and your role in that. Yes, yeah, sure. So it'd be really easy to just retweet what Janet and Jim just said, <laughs> but I'll try to add a little bit more color. You know, taking a step back, like Jim, you know, leaving a, a company that I was so familiar with, one of the things that was really a driver for me was making sure that my next chapter represented a little bit more purpose and mission for me that was tied to my personal beliefs. And one of those is DNI for sure, um, and DEI. And when Coles reached out, the first thing I noticed, female CEO. First time in my 20 year career that I would have the opportunity to work for a female CEO. That was big for me. Um, and then I started to do my own research similar to Jim to understand, hey, is this performative or is this actually something that Coles is embedding throughout you know, every single thing that they do, whether it be communities, customers, products and services, employees, et cetera. Um, and I started to dig into this sort of three pillar framework that Coles had been very public about sharing. And it focused on exactly what Jim kind of described as these companies have an obligation to sort of represent the communities that they serve. Right. We are like microcosms of society and we need to look that way, um, whether it's internally with our team members and our workforce or externally with the products and services we provide. Um, and so this three pillar framework really focused on diversity, equity and inclusion for our people. So our workforce, diversity, equity and inclusion for our customers and diversity and equity and inclusion for our community. 
And when you peel that back, there are so many things that were happening, but specifically in the technology space, we have done a ton to try to amplify DEI across all of Cole's technology. And one of the things I'm most proud of, and it's very similar to what Year Up does, is are these apprenticeship programs. Um, where we go find these partnerships to say, hey, maybe we we go and look for talent that doesn't have this traditional background, if you will, and try to ensure that they have the skills that they need to be effective technologists within the organization. So we've really been doing a lot in the apprenticeship space. The other thing that we've been doing, um, and it's in the very early stages, is around this returnship program. Um, so making sure, you know, there may be people um, who have left the workforce that were technologists for whatever reason, who are now trying to return. So we've been partnering with organizations to ensure that we have a returnship uh, programs and opportunities for people who want to come back into the technology sector. Um, and then the other thing is strengthening our external relationships. So I myself am a member of the Executive Leadership Council. I've since kind of helped Coles understand what that is and how can we better partner with them to help develop our talent uh, we're looking at strengthening partnerships with Nesby and SHIP and Grace Hopper and other organizations. So really starting to build a stronger pipeline um, so that we can we can make sure we're bringing that talent into the into the four walls of coal. So we've got a lot going on and I'm excited about it. Yeah, I love it. And I think that in this moment that we're living, you know, we look at and not to kind of pick on the females, but, you know, it's a lens that I just bring. Like we know that women have left the workforce through covid in droves in comparison, right? And so I think the conversation around returnships and hire to train, finding people that are good athletes and have passion and train them for skill is such an opportunity. And I hope that everyone knows that if you're, you know, like don't discount yourselves, if you will, because you may not like necessarily fit all the boxes, if you will. I think that organizations are opening the aperture to think about how do we hire for passion, hire for culture and purpose and then train for skill, right? Because I think that creates just a really incredible experience. So um, you brought up something, Nikki, I think is important. I'm gonna kind of, I am gonna kind of shoot this over to Janet and it's about accountability of your partners, right? And the ecosystem there. So Janet, you know, what are you doing to drive accountability both within the organization and those external partners, like right? whether it's technology vendors or suppliers or whatever it may yeah. be. And how do you think about this to ensure like that critical change is cultural and is not just this moment that we're living in? So great question and topic. Um, I just want to pull on a thread um, that Nikki talked about for a moment. Um, she just um, sort of blew by talking about the ELC, which is an amazing organization. I think one of the things that has been the most important learning for me in my journey um, in both DEI and technology at its intersection is this idea that we have to keep learning and listening. You know, I, I see myself as someone who is a strong DEI leader. I said that in my introduction, but I had the privilege to attend a CEO event that the ELC hosted um, about um, now 18 months ago. Time is so crazy right now. I think it was about 18 months ago. And I will tell you that that event was fundamentally changed my own views and i because I have the privilege of being the role that I'm in has helped shape Deloitte's agenda um, around equity from an event that I attended with really open ears. It was a crazy, it was, I had to take a red eye to get there. And I was thinking, what am I doing? And the speakers um, and the conversations I had at this ELC event were phenomenal. So Nikki, I just wanted to shout out to the work that the ELC is doing to help, um, on so many dimensions, us all continue this journey of lifelong learners. As technologists, we kind of get that lifelong learning is part of what we do. So Christy, I haven't even begun to answer your question, so I'm gonna try, try to jump right to it. Um, Jim said something super important that I wanna underscore that I think is so critical, which is that tone does start at the top with the CEO, the executive team, and the board around absolutely um, the journey that we're talking about today. And one of the things that I've really learned from my time with ELC that has been probably the most important tone from the top message that I've encouraged our board and our management team is all about disaggregated data, measurable actions, and then holding leaders accountable for change. So I'll just try to talk very briefly. Many of us 
and most of us live in data-driven organizations. Um, that is sort of at our heart and at our heart and soul. And the importance of disaggregating the da our data around diversity in particular is essential because you're just asking better questions of your data and shifting from traditional metrics to frankly more meaningful ones that are a much more granular levels of detail. We've been doing a lot of that work in terms of the diversity of our workforce, which frankly, we used to aggregate up our data to a level that it might look okay at the surface. And in our transparency report that we published for the first time this year, we worked very aggressively to disaggregate our data. And that was both by, by, by race, by gender, by level, by part, part of the workforce that people were in. So we could talk all day about disaggregating data. But part of that, I believe, is recognizing that each of us hold immense influence externally in the marketplace, which is, I think, one of the threads you were getting at, and how we spend our dollars in the supply chain. So we did go through at Deloitte a data-driven exercise that we released in our transparency report. And one of the goals we set coming out of the analysis was to increase our addressable spend on diverse suppliers to a billion dollars by 2025. Another thing that we're looking at, and I would encourage everyone to think about is DEI criteria for engagement in your procurement and contracting process. I had the privilege for many years um, to serve our clients in the public sector, both in state government and federal government, who frankly, in some ways have been well ahead of the business community in terms of expectations in their suppliers about their own diversity and inclusion criteria within their organizations. So we've been focused both on our own spend and in the spend of our suppliers. But I don't wanna lose the thread on how you sustain cultural change, um, Christy, because your point about the moment I think is critical. So all of us who've had the privilege to lead big technology transformations as the four of us um, on, um, on the screen here have today know that Big change can be enabled by technology, but has to be, frankly, supported by and led by the culture, and that that is incredibly difficult work and critical to the success of any change, whether that's a technology change, whether that's a change in your workforce. And the lens which with I've started to really learn and understand is this constant attention that we need to flipping orthodoxies and changing the patterns of the way we do things here. I mean, I, I have not um, uh, made the leap as Jim and Nikki have. I've just, I'll hit my 30 years at Deloitte um, this summer. Um, and we have a very strong culture, a culture we're really proud of. And but we do very casually use the language of the way we do things here. And we're an organization that helps our clients transform all the time. But when we think about many dimensions of our culture, we've really had to think about how we flip our orthodoxies. Uh, we did, and I had the, the honor to help sponsor a piece of work called the Equity Imperative, which is a call to action for the broader business community in our role in equity. And a big piece of that was looking really hard at our own orthodoxies as we thought about the challenge we were giving to the business community. So a lot of them are around the vendor supplier issue that there are not enough vendors or suppliers um, from diverse backgrounds. And there's great organizations doing really good work on that. But I'll use a quick one around our or own organization and talent. So we absolutely think of ourselves as an unbiased meritocracy in terms of how we um, both hire, develop, and accelerate talent in our organization. What meritocracies, however, don't often consider is not everyone is entering the system at the same place. And what it needs to means to be fair and balanced and unbiased needs to be challenged and really sort of unpacked in a much more fundamental way um, that, than I certainly ever understood or appreciated. Um, and I have the privilege in this role of really helping put the discipline into the board and the C-suite um, in terms of making that change foundational in how we flip our orthodoxies to drive the kind of sustainable change that we've been talking about here today. So those are a few of my thoughts. I, as you can tell, Christy, I have a lot of energy around this topic and think there's a lot of threads we can continue to pull on in this conversation. So back to you to help us do that. This might need to be like the first in a series because I think we could talk for hours and hours about it. And then we're getting good chatter um, in the chat too. So uh, we'll keep it going. 
So I'm going to um, kind of pivot slightly and get Jim and Nikki's perspectives on how do we and how do you as technology leaders specifically, like what have you done to kind of make this real? And I'm going to make it broad. So feel, you know, comfortable to kind of taking this whichever way you go. Right. So Janet brought up the conversation around data and as technology leaders, you know, in, in many organizations, the technology leader owns the data. Right. And so how do you what's your role in that? How do you educate the organization? How do you bring it together and in, use it in a way that is productive and not scary and becomes a part of sustainable change? And at the same time, too, I also want to know, like, how are you changing the way that your organization engages with that, too, and thinks about how their roles impact the outcomes in DEI? How about you first, Nikki? Okay. <laughs> so, um, I was, uh, well, so the interesting thing is, let me take a step back. When I think about data, I think about data answering three questions, right? What's happening? What does it mean? What do I do? And what I've seen in the past is a lot of times we focus on what's happening and all of the calories are put into just understanding what's going on. Uh, and if you put this, the lens of diversity and inclusion on there is typically, okay, what, what, do, what, um, what do we have um, in terms of our workforce? What do the demographics of our workforce look like, right? And you, just, and you look at the data through that lens. But those second two questions, what does it mean and what do I do? That's usually where things get a little bit more complex or a lot of the calories aren't, aren't spent because we spend a lot of time just trying to understand what does our workforce look like? Um, so I always try to think about it through the, the lens of those three questions. Now, it, within Kohl's, we have, we're very early stages, if I had to compare to kind of what I was able to do or what we were able to do at Boeing and, try, and sort of understanding that first question, right? What does our workforce look like? Um, and what does it mean and what do we do about it? For my specific team, one of the things that I've done, and I'll just give an example, is I'm, I'm very happy to request this data from you know, our HR team. I can provide it obviously from a technology perspective, but I'll ask the HR team to kind of put a, put a lens on it for me. Um, but once I see that, I am very aggressive about what I want our outcome to be. Um, I've told my team multiple times, we need to be representative. We're a microcosm of society. We need to be representative of this community where our products and services are sold. And so if, for example, if there's an opening in my team, especially one that, that is in our, our, what we call management board, I'm slow to move. In other words, I'm not rushing just to take the first slate of candidates that the HR team gives me because I wanna hurry up and fill a role. I always require that the slate is diverse and I always require that the interview panel is diverse. And those are things to me that are very simple changes that we can make today that I am already making that has tremendously opened up the pipeline of candidates that are showing up now um, in, in our workforce. So I think the making sure we first understand what is that, what is the data that we have access to? What does it mean and what should we do about it? But then my role as a leader is to absolutely make changes right away and make sure that I model those changes and enforce those changes across my team. Um, so the diverse slates and the diverse interview panels make a huge difference right away. So you can use the data to kind of understand what's happening, but allow that to influence how you change the business model when you think about attracting and retaining talent. Right. That was good. And Christy, you know, I, I'll take it from a similar, maybe a little bit different route. Um, one, I have a fantastic HR partner and a woman named Gail King who is retiring after a long tenure at Nationwide. Uh, but one of the things that Gail did a long time ago was institute a chief diversity officer. It's not something that's new for us. It's something that's always really existed. And, and that office has really put a spotlight on data. And so my first job is to make sure that we have the systems and data to support the chief diversity officer in driving forward what is our first value, which is we value people. Now, I can tell you the way that plays itself out back to the discussion we've all been having about the board is every year, myself and each of my peers, we have a, a session with the HR committee of the board. Each one of us kind of rotates through each board meeting and, and they ask us one question in every board meeting, which is what's your diversity look like today? And then the follow on question to it, what are you doing to change that look going forward? 
And we spend a significant amount of time, each one of us with the HR committee, looking at the data, talking about where we've been, and, and as Nikki put it, where do we need to go from here? And what are the specific actions that we're taking to do to, to get there? And the technology team, you know, we've done a couple of things. Uh, you've got to look for non-traditional sources of talent. Uh, again, using the data, one of the things that you'll see within technology is it's not a very diverse function. It's really hard when you look at the graduates that are coming out of colleges and universities around the United States to get a makeup of technologists that matches what the makeup of demographics are in our customer base. So you can't let that be a stopping point. If you know that's the case, what are you going to do to win your unfair share of diverse candidates? Uh, are you active on uh, historically black colleges and universities. You know, for us, we've made significant investments in Winston-Salem University and Central State University. We, we have physical presence there. We will see our branded logos up on computer labs. We're spending on time in campus at school. Why? Because the data says I got to win my unfair share of diverse candidates. The second thing that we've really been focused on is the data says there's not enough people coming into the technology function. How do you change that? Partnerships with organizations like Europe and Perscolas are allowing us to go after um, uh, this this function I keep calling opportunity youth, but but it's a it's a, a generation of kids. Just in Franklin County here where I live, there are forty thousand opportunity youth who are going to be destined to a minimum wage job if they're not given a set of skills to get a long term career. So by investing a little bit of dollars and getting them some training, a skill, how to code, how to be an analyst in a cybersecurity operations, how to fix a computer or a PC, I can get them into my organization in an entry level job where I can then sponsor them to get an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree on my dime. But I'm helping build a talent base that's bigger than what was out there today, because there's just not enough diverse talent to make my team look like my customers look. And so I think that's the second way you've got to use the data is, is not just what does it say, but what, do, what power do you have as a leader to change the data, to make it be what you would like it to be or what you need it to be. And then lastly, as a leader, I think it's important that you expect the same thing from your leaders. That, you know, just like I spend time in front of the board, I expect my leaders to come in and spend time with me every year to talk about what they're doing to propagate diversity, equity, and inclusion in their, in their organizations. And then lastly, across the entire organization, you just gotta make sure that leaders have the data available to them to understand everything from diversity to inclusion. They're all very different topics that need to have a very look, a different look at data. Uh, and again, just making sure that you've got the right systems in place, the right access to them to be able to go in, to be able to make those decisions from. Yeah. And, you know, data is, it is very powerful, right? Um, and I'll, and I, we don't necessarily need to go deep into it, but I, you know, I think it's one piece of the overall equation, right? We're seeing, um, you know, ourselves and our partners, you know, use technology and even AI as an example, right? Like yeah. using technology and the capabilities that technology provides to actually change those outcomes, right? So data is the, what's the situation? What does it mean? And technology and in, in its various forms can happen, can change kind of the, what am I going to do about it, right? So how do you use AI to change the experiences that a professional might have within the organization in terms of surfacing opportunities or deploying to projects or, you know, you name it. Um, but it, you know, it spans, it's wide and deep, right? And there's such an opportunity and an imperative there. Christy, if I could just jump in here where I thought you might be going with the AI conversation, and maybe that is a, maybe this is a follow-up conversation that we have, because we have not pulled on the thread of the ethical use of technology um, and the responsibility that I believe as technology leaders, and though I'm, um, I happen to sit in a different role today, I still think of myself as a technology leader, is our own understanding and appreciation for the biases that can be inherent um, in the use of technology in all of our organizations um, in terms of how we harness the amazing sets of technologies that we have. Um, I, I happen to believe that a lot of that is also um, that we need to pay attention to who's on the teams that are designing the solutions that we're offering to our customers, to our organizations, to our clients, um, and that diversity in those teams and awareness around the ethical use of the technology solutions, which is very easy to just point at sort of social media or the, or the companies that are the broad platforms that all of us use. But I do believe that each one of us, we Deloitte as a service provider, Nationwide Coles also has responsibilities for the solutions that we're providing to the marketplace 
and how diverse teams and our collective awareness around uh, potential biases in our technology solutions is critical as well. So that's also an area where I and we have been leaning in and I think is an incredibly important thread of the technology, not just diverse teams, but how we use technology. Janet, you are absolutely right. And it's not, it, so makeup of the team is job one. The second thing when you're dealing with AI is you've got to build anti-bias logic into the model itself. Uh, a model inherently doesn't know where bias comes from, and it's just going to look at the data that it's given. And so if you don't think about developing models um, from an artificial intelligence perspective to know the things that it shouldn't bias on, it's going to automatically tend to go to those biased data points. And so I think that's the other thing is not only do you have to have a team makeup that that is going to help prevent the design of bias in, you've also literally got to train the model to know what bias looks like so that it doesn't follow bias. You know, one of the biggest opportunities that we see in the short run is in our hiring practices. Uh, unconscious bias is out there, we know it plays in. And so if you think about how a, a resume comes into us, how do, you, how do you present the data about the candidate to the recruiter or to the hiring manager in a way that you take those components out so they aren't a factor in how they're making a decision of who gets into that first interview. And I love what Nikki said, we're doing the same thing. Your interview panel needs to look like, uh, needs to look like the makeup of the talent that you want at the end. So if you don't have a diverse panel, not just a diverse slate, but a diverse panel, and all these things play together, but technology can help because it can take the data out that can tend to drive those bias actions uh, but you got to think about it. If you're a technologist, how do you build that into the model? Yeah, it's either a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle, right? So I think about, especially in a technology organization where it tends to be a little not diverse enough, I'll just say, right? And it has led to the con whole conversation around bias in the data and the training data and everything that we use. So as we create, even within a technology function, like more diverse teams, and diversity comes in different colors, flavors, experiences, all of it, like it, you know, the data, like financial data proves that as we create those diverse teams, we have better financial outcomes. But even into your point, like when we start using AI, if we have diverse teams building those, then it's good begets good and becomes this very virtuous cycle that, you know, we all benefit from in, in miraculous ways. Um, I can't believe that we're actually nearing kind of the end of this conversation. I feel like we've literally just got, got started um, but I want to ask another question real quick, and maybe we can get to a second one. And for those kind of on the line, please don't hesitate to use the chat. Um, but I'd like to kind of ask, and you know, Nikki, I'll start with you. You know, change happens by asking why not. And I would like to understand, like, what potential bold plays are you all considering to enable kind of tech-enabled DEI and to foster more diversity and inclusion within your technology workforce? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest ones um, most recently is our sort of decoupling what we think the workforce um, geography should look like. So in the past, um, we were very sort of centralized in near headquarters and corporate functions were all kind of um, required to a certain degree to be physically located in that same space or very close to in proximity to that space. We've since broadened the aperture to say, you know what, we'll take the talent where it is. Um, now, granted, we're trying to make sure we have these sort of centralized hubs of talent. So for example, Atlanta is a place that we're looking, DC where I'm located is another sort of talent hub, if you will, from a technology perspective, Chicago, LA, um, Austin, Texas, right? But for the most part, we're going to um, start to broaden the aperture and make sure we, we, we recruit that talent, we attract that talent, from where that talent is. These traditional workforce models of you have to be located at HQ is just, I think it was one of the things at Boeing that we were starting to have early conversations about. I have to wholeheartedly thank COVID for accelerating the dialogue. Yeah. Cause I think it proved to us that we can work from anywhere, especially in the technology space. And so now what's happening is we're seeing ourselves develop this sort of remote worker community. Um, where how do we engage with each other? How do we make sure we're still able to foster that environment of inclusion and psychological safety and everyone feeling like they're a member of a team, even though we aren't physically located next to one another? Um, so that to me is like our next big opportunity. I won't say challenge, um, but the biggest lever we just recently pulled was, hey, let's relax this traditional workforce model. Let's see what it looks like when we meet the talent where they are. And it's 
so far it's really starting to pay huge dividends for us. Yeah, an absolute silver lining of COVID, if you can say that, right? Yeah, if you gotta find the good in everything. <laughs> yeah. Jim, how about you? Um, you know, so uh, just add a few things on it, Nikki. One thing you, we've looked at too in the technology organization is the language we use. You know, words set tone. Uh, and if you think about the language of technology, there's a lot of bad history in our language. We talk about server environments having a, a master and a slave. We talk about security lists having a white list and a black list. Um, we started to remove that language. Uh, we, we recognized that it was propagating kind of an old thought process and you know, language matters, words matter from time to time. We recently just did a, a whole hour session that our DNI committee drove and we came up with a lot of great words. So, you know, we've replaced whitelist, blacklist with accept it, uh, allow and, and disallow list. Uh, master and slave, we no longer use those terms. And so I think that's one thing that seems pretty obvious that you don't think about and it's pretty simple, but you don't recognize how people are reacting to the language that you use. And so kind of scouring through your tech list of, of words, what are the things that might be driving a culture that you don't want to propagate? That's something that we've done that seemed pretty obvious that nobody really thought about that is, has driven a, a change for us. And, and the second thing that we did is when we created our DE and I committee within the technology organization, we had far more people who volunteered to participate than we had spots. And so we asked a simple question, why? And it drove a whole movement of what's your why? And the whys were pretty incredible. Uh, one person's why was they have a son who's autistic and they know that he's not gonna have the opportunities that other children are gonna have. And so he wanted to be involved because he wanted to set a path where we can have a more inclusive environment that welcomes somebody with his background. There was somebody else who worked at another company where they were actively discriminated against. And they wanna make sure that the culture that they help drive here at Nationwide doesn't provide that. Asking people what their why is, why they think this is important, was important. Mine, mine goes back to my two daughters. You know, my two daughters are in college now, and as they went through high school and in grade school and junior high, I saw them continually get focused away from STEM. Even though they were really talented at it, it was a culture that said, nope, these are other jobs that you should be more interested in. And I said, this just isn't right. And so my why is about my two kids, but when you get to people's individual purpose, they will jump through over mountains, it will jump over mountains to help you drive a change and drive the culture that you're trying to get to here. So those are a couple simple examples of things that we've done here to really advance the discussion and, and make it real for people. Yeah. I just I'm, want to I'm, underscore, Jim, your, um, your comment of words matter because I think that's such a powerful frame. How we've uh, thought about that is we have an exercise that we call say this, not that. Um, and some of it is about sort of technical things. Some of it is just language that sort of permeates everyday business community. And we've found this exercise of say this, not that, which we do broadly. And then we've worked on with various, various cohorts of what mat words matter um, to them has been incredibly powerful and has been a great learning for all of us. And it is absolutely still a continuous journey because we um, we're continuing to take in new concepts and ideas of things that um, we would not, I, I couldn't safely say I would not have thought of and sort of, sort of through this elevated lens, creating a much more inclusive and equitable environment. So I just wanted to underscore your comment there because it was really powerful to me. And I love the, the conversation about what's your why, because I was going to get to a point of like, you know, because you've always been an incredible ally, ally since I've known you, but we can all be allies, right? And I love the, like, think about and challenge ourselves to what's our why. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. I, we have a ton of questions. I cannot thank you all for joining in the LinkedIn Live environment, but really, Nikki, Jim, Janet, it's been a massive gift, and I really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you. Our pleasure. Take care. Thanks.